Hi, I'm Amina Khan with the Los Angeles Times, and we're here to talk about Dawn's, NASA's Dawn mission to Ceres. I'm here with the mission's principal, deputy principal investigator, Carol Raymond, and we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, first visit ever to a dwarf planet. Carol, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a historic day for planetary exploration. I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. So, so Dawn actually entered orbit around Ceres this morning, really early this morning, something like 4.39 a.m. What's the mood like in the office? Well, we're all extremely uh, happy to be in orbit. Of course, it's, um, it's, a, it's a moment in time of this journey that we've been taking for the last uh, seven and a half years, and it's um, just a, a, a nice milestone to have behind us, and we're really, really looking forward to all of the fantastic exploration that's going to occur now that we're at our final destination. Very cool. So, so what, is it, what is it that's so special about Ceres? There's five dwarf planets, right? What is it about Ceres that makes it worth a visit? Well, Ceres is the only dwarf planet that's in the inner solar system, and so it's the only um, besides Pluto, which we're we're going um, NASA is going to uh, reach later this year. Um, the other dwarf planets are are very very far away. Mm -hmm. So um, Ceres is fairly accessible, and um, importantly, it represents a um, a remnant from the very beginning of our own solar system. By going there and investigating it, we're going to learn more about how our planetary system formed. Very cool. Do you guys feel at all smug that you got there before uh, the New Horizons mission got to Pluto? Is there any competition there? Um, maybe a little, <laughs> but we're 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 very happy because this is you know the year of the dwarf planet, and it's it's very nice to um, have so much exciting planetary exploration going on you know concurrently. Very cool. So. So Ceres is um, an asteroid, right? The biggest member of the, the asteroid belt. You mentioned it could tell us something about our, our early history, but what, what is it that, that we could potentially learn? And also, how, what did our solar system look like back when Ceres was formed? How different was it? What could we, what could we find out? Yeah, so Ceres represents one of the building blocks. Um, there were many objects like Ceres, and, and Vesta, its sibling that we visited earlier with the Dawn mission, um, is, is another planetary building block. And there were many of these, and they uh, many of them merged together to form the planets as we know them. So um, they don't exist anymore except for these two that we know of in the main asteroid belt. The other material in the main asteroid belt are largely um, pieces of these larger bodies that got disrupted and, mm -hmm. and they're collisional fragments, whereas Vesta and Ceres are really intact uh, building blocks, protoplanets, if you will. So by, by going to uh, each of them and doing this detailed exploration, we're learning about the, the ingredients, basically, um, and what kinds of material and in what form um, was available during our planetary formation process. Okay, now Vesta is really, really different from Ceres, right? I mean, they don't they don't look anything alike, as far as That's I can right. tell. Does does that tell us something about what the early solar system was like? Um, we think so. Um, Vesta formed uh, very dry and rocky, mm -hmm. uh, but we expect the Vesta and Ceres formed largely from the same initial material, um, and that would be the solar nebula. Um, Vesta formed a little bit closer to the sun, and it may it may have formed a material that was a little bit drier initially. But um, we think the main difference is that Vesta formed very very early on, and um, at the the first million to two million years of our um, uh, solar system formation, there was a lot of short lived radioactive material that generated a tremendous amount of heat. So any body that formed very early on. Um, incorporated that heat producing material and it caused melting. So Vesta melted completely, boiled off the water and other light elements and ended up being dry and rocky with an iron core, very similar to the Earth and the Moon mm -hmm. and Mars. And Ceres on the other hand, we know has retained its water and its light elements. Um, and so that points to its origin being um, just a little bit later than Vesta, but before Jupiter grew um, to the to the size where it started to um, to govern all of the um, dynamics of the asteroid belt. Very cool. They're kind of like they're kind of like siblings. They have the same parents, but slightly different life histories, and they went in real That's different right. directions. Nurture versus nature, right? <laughs> On that note, do you have a favorite? 
No, I don't. <laughs> we won't tell um, them. I, I, I like them both. I think that we that our exploration went in the right direction because Vesta was an object we actually knew quite a bit about because um, we know there's a, a many, many meteorites on the Earth that came from Vesta. About um, one in six meteorites on the Earth have come from Vesta. And uh, now we've made that, that um, connection very firmly. So by studying these pieces of Vesta in the lab, um, we, we know a, a, a lot of detailed information um, coupled with, with Dawn's investigation. And Ceres, on the other hand, it's, it's bigger, it's, it's, a pro, yeah, it's a dwarf planet, it's a uh, wet object, and it's in the asteroid belt in the, in the neighborhood where uh, other wet asteroids live, and main belt comets. So it's, it's in this region that's very transitional between the, the dry, rocky inner uh, solar system and the, the wet, icy bodies of the outer solar system. So we're, um, you know, the, the series is, is such an interesting body that's been so mysterious for so long that uh, I'm really happy that, that um, we're getting there last because it, I think some major discoveries await us there. Yeah, so before Dawn got to Ceres, we really didn't know very much at all about the dwarf planet. The pictures that we got were from the Hubble Space Telescope, and they were so fuzzy. We have one here from 2004, and that was that was our best our best view. Um, and compare that to to what we have today from Dawn. It's it's very very different. But That's you know, great. early on, it seemed like we thought that you know, Ceres would be really, really smooth because it had so much water. It was really icy. Has that picture been changing? Um, absolutely. Um, Ceres obviously is not very smooth. Um, and we are already, you know, sort of speculating uh, what might be the reason why we do see a cratered surface. But I'll point out that the, it's not uniformly cratered and there are areas that are much smoother than others. Mm -hmm. um, so we're what we're um, concluding is that there are um, geologic processes going on in the subsurface of Ceres that are reflected on the surface. So we've got craters that have central peaks and that tells us about um, ice in the subsurface. We have some smooth areas and we need to find out what's going on, whether there's something that's come up and spread around on the surface from below. And then we have, of course, these um, brightness variations. Mm -hmm. And those are extremely intriguing. And um, you know, we don't yet have uh, any firm conclusion about them from this uh, low resolution data, but they are certainly um, something that we're going to explain because our data eventually is going to be um, so high resolution that I'm sure that we'll have it um, figured out. Yeah, so that the brightness variations that you're talking about, we've seen some two of these really, really bright spots on on Ceres um, that have become sort of a, a big a big talking point among scientists yeah. and lay people alike. I mean, is there anything else like that in the in the solar system? I mean, they, it looks like there's somebody shining a giant flashlight from the surface. Yeah, there's been a lot of of discussion of laser beams and things like that. Um, it is unique. The, the, those bright spots are unique um, in the solar system. We don't see something quite that bright that's so um, su such a, um, a localized source of um, of brightness variation. Um, so it's it's a little bit perplexing right now. Um, but uh, as I said, you know we, we will be able to unravel the the story mm -hmm. as we go forward. Now, you, it's so interesting that you can learn so much from what's from the surface about what's happening underneath the surface. Um, and one of the things that people used to think was that there was a ocean and there might have been an ocean inside yeah. Ceres. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so I, I want to emphasize too that um, everybody uh, sees pictures and they understand we're going to take a lot of images and 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 we're going to have a good visual. Um, sense of what Ceres looks like, but we're also taking data in different wavelengths of reflected light, and that tells us about the minerals on the surface. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we're mapping the geology, all the different rock types, all the different clays, what they're made out of, and um, and their elements. And from reading that record, then we're going to um, be able to build up a story of the uh, the history of of Ceres evolution. Um, in the past, when Ceres was young, it had um, 
it also had radioactive material inside of it, um, as all the bodies in the solar system did. And, and that generated enough heat that the rock and the ice uh, separated. It didn't melt like Vesta did, but the rock separated from its lighter elements like the, the water. Um, and so that um, water existed as a liquid ocean for some period of time because of the internal heat that was still escaping. And then eventually the body cooled enough that it froze out into an ocean. And so we don't expect that there's um, water in the subsurface today, but we do expect a fairly substantial ice layer at the surface. And we do also expect that in the past there were um, processes occurring on the ocean floor and that um, material that was generated there in environments that are um, similar to, say, a, a hydrothermal um, area on our ocean floor, um, made their way to the surface and were spread around. Um, and now we can go and find those deposits and be able to work back to what was going on in the subsurface. That's very cool. But so that means we're probably not going to find any ice volcanoes today. Is that what you're telling me? Well, um, I, I, I don't <laughs> think we're going to see ice volcanoes that are generated from series um, own internal heat. Okay. But what we, um, what we are uh, curious about is what the um, effect of impactors has had mm -hmm. on, on series. So, so you can think of it, you, you're bringing something in at a, a fairly um, high speed and crashing into a surface which has some subsurface ice and, and just that the heat of that impact could be melting the ice. Mm -hmm. So there, um, we expect that there are some localized um, uh, effects of, um, of, you know, so localized heating and, and that may drive some transient geologic processes. So again, we're looking for those kinds of associations um, on the surface. Very cool. So a viewer wants to know, um, will we be seeing true color images from Ceres in the future? Uh, yes, we will. We have, um, we have filters on our camera that, that give us um, wavelengths across the visible spectrum. Mm -hmm. We also have a visible IR uh, spectrometer, which does, uh, is, is a hyperspectral imager. So we get um, really uh, strong coverage across all the different wavelengths, and so we will see series in true color. Um, but I'll caution that um, it's not going to be that exciting. Um, series we already know series spectrum is fairly flat, um, so some of these bright spots may um, may look very interesting visually, but but in general, it's um, not going to be extremely colorful. Okay. Well, now that Ceres has entered orbit, what is uh, the next time that we're going to be getting some some new images and some new data coming from Dawn? Yeah, so um, as you know, we're on the dark side, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to be <laughs> taking a loop for the next uh, few weeks. Uh, everyone's going to catch their breath uh, and get ready for the fabulous data that's going to come down um, at starting at the last uh, or the third week of August. We get into what we call the RC3 orbit at about um, 14,000 kilometers altitude. And from that uh, vantage point, we watch Ceres rotate um, several times. And we also look at Ceres from uh, the dark side, uh, looking at the, uh, the illuminated limb. And that helps us to, um, to build up the, um, the photometric characteristics, the way that Ceres um, reflects light. And that helps us to calibrate our data, as well as look search for anything that's being lifted off the surface of Ceres, like dust, that might be coming off the surface because gas is escaping. And that's, um, you know, one of the motivations for those measurements is to follow up on the Herschel Space Observatory detection of water vapor around Ceres, which was reported last year. Right, so it sounds like Ceres is, is pretty active, um, at least geophysically, in a lot of different ways. Do we ever think that there was a chance that life could have um, emerged? Um, well, there's always a chance, and um, but I, I would say that Ceres is is part of a club of uh, icy objects like Enceladus in Europa that um, where the the habitat for life appears to be um, more richer than mm -hmm. uh, than perhaps on other bodies, and of course, you know, Mars is is another um, environment that that people look at as a possible habitat for life. Um, so we are um, approaching this from with, with that uh, question in mind, and uh, we'll do everything that we can with our instrumentation to try to um, fill out that story. But we don't have some of the um, 
you know, we, we don't have instrumentation which would really allow us to probe that question in detail. That's going to be left to um, a follow-on probe that hopefully is going to go and land on the surface of Ceres and, and really um, investigate it at, at a, um, the next level of detail. Very cool. Well, Dr. Raymond, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Congratulations on getting Dawn into orbit. Um, thank you. Thank you. So this, uh, my name is Amina Khan um, with the Los Angeles Times. We've been talking about Dawn, the Dawn mission to Ceres, and I've been speaking with Dr. Carol Raymond of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Thank you so much.